1999, the Columbine shooting shook the United States to its very core. It was something the country had never seen before and something we all hoped to never see again, though unfortunately we have many more times. In the wake of the tragedy, parents, teachers, and law enforcement alike became determined to ensure that this would never happen in their town. With little time to react and a call to action from the general population, the country seemed to agree on one course of action, zero tolerance policies. Where in the past, students were given chances to redeem their mistakes, face minor punishments, or have discipline handed down by the schools, the new way of life relied abundantly on the juvenile justice system to intervene on even the smallest signs of bad behavior. At first, this was what everyone wanted, but as time went on, the cracks in the new strict system began to show. Enter Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. Like the rest of the United States, the tiny quiet area of Pennsylvania was begging for new methods of discipline that they thought would keep their kids safe in school. So in the late 90s and early 2000s, they turned to one man to do the job, Mark Shivarella. With a reputation for being tough on crime, the judge was once a beloved member of the community. Schools, parents, and law enforcement held him up as the shining example of a man with one mission, to keep kids safe. Only there was something else going on that people hadn't quite figured out yet. While the judge made his way around town giving speeches and touting his famous zero tolerance line to children, he was actually the one breaking the law. Judge Civarella, along with Judge Michael Conahan, a lawyer named Robert Powell, and a developer named Robert Miracle had all developed a plan that was going to make them rich and they didn't seem to care what lives they ruined in the process. While the public believed the juvenile justice system was working all to plan, the four men were running a scheme that allowed them to build a for-profit juvenile detention center and profit millions of dollars. All it took was for them to lock thousands of kids away for crimes as minor as stealing a candy bar or creating a mock MySpace page. And this went on for years with the citizens of Luzerne County being none the wiser. That is of course, until they were finally caught. The Kids for Cash scandal, as it has come to be known, is one of the biggest to ever hit the juvenile justice system. So what exactly happened here? What was going on in Pennsylvania and how did four men motivated by greed change the lives of thousands without anyone blinking an eye? Hello and welcome to Multilevel Mondays. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be discussing the massive kids for cash scandal that shocked everyone. The nearly two decades long story is full of twists and turns that are sure to leave anyone with their mouths on the floor wondering how can anyone be so corrupt? First, let's start with the victims, the kids. Now, please be advised that the next couple minutes will describe stories involving minors that may be difficult for some to hear and brief mentions of suicide. If that's too much for you to hear at the moment, feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter. Now, when Hillary Transu was 14 years old, she created a prank that she believed to be harmless. Never in her wildest dreams would she expect what came of it. One day, she went on MySpace, posed as her vice principal and made fun of her strictness. Below the hoax, she posted a disclaimer, making all aware that this was in fact a joke. She wrote, when you find this, I hope you have a sense of humor. Unfortunately, it turned out that people did not have a sense of humor. Shortly after Hillary posted her MySpace page, her school called the police and she returned home to officers knocking at her door. This is where Hillary's life changed forever. Like everyone in the United States, she was entitled to a lawyer. However, her mom had been assured that there was no need for her to have representation. They claimed this was going to be an easy open and shut case. And they told her she would likely only get probation, nothing to worry about. So Hillary's mom, scared for her daughter's future, decided to trust the police officers and became one of the many parents at the time to sign a waiver denying legal representation designated specifically by Judge Shivarella. During the time that he ran the courtroom, over 50% of cases were completed without representation. Scared out of her mind, but feeling assured that she would be okay and the judge would do the right thing, Hillary entered the courtroom. Her hearing for her crime of making a joke on MySpace about her school vice principal lasted only one minute. Lauren Transu, Hillary's mother, remembers the moment vividly and she says, Shivarella slammed his hand down on the desk and said, what makes you think you can get away with this crap? When I turned around to look, Hillary was gone. It was almost like she evaporated. 60 seconds, just keep that in mind, one minute. That's how long it took for their lives to be changed forever. 
frantic and confused about what just happened, Lauren called the juvenile law center in Philadelphia. Three weeks into Hillary's sentence at a juvenile detention center, she was released. But this didn't mean she could just leave everything behind her because she was still on probation. It hadn't all just disappeared. In her mind, she felt like she was one of the bad kids who deserved what happened to her. Weeks after leaving, she was in the party scene, she says. I hung with a crowd that smoked pot and drank. I had to get on camera and pretend to be this person I really didn't think I was. We'd laugh about how we had everyone fooled about what good kids we were when we were really just terrible people. Now, obviously, Hillary is clearly not a terrible person. She's just someone who did a prank at 14, but it has taken years for her to just leave her past behind. To this day, she still struggles with what happened to her. Unfortunately, Hillary's story is just one. While Mark Chivarella and Michael Conahan remain judges in Pennsylvania, they placed over 2000 kids into the juvenile justice system. Each case you read is more heartbreaking than the last, might I add. When Melanie Petrio was only 12 years old, she found herself in front of Chivarella in juvenile court. According to her story, the judge didn't even allow her to speak during her hearing. And what was her crime, you might ask? Well, one day a friend visited her house. The visiting friend set a small fire in the garbage can placed outside of Melanie's house. And by the time she had gone inside to get a glass of water, the police had arrived. Melanie was arrested and sentenced to a juvenile detention center for months. She describes her time as saying, "'It was horrifying. I had to put a blanket over my head so the cockroaches wouldn't fall on me.'" Her entire life was turned upside down. She would appear in front of the judge two more times, spending the majority of her childhood in juvenile detention centers. For her, the run-in with Chivarella and her subsequent incarcerations screwed up her life. All for someone else deciding to set fire to a garbage can, might I add. Zachary Richards was sentenced to juvenile detention after stealing a Hershey bar. From 14 to 18, he found himself in and out of juvenile detention. Sadly, at the age of 27, Zachary took his own life. Unfortunately, he's not the only one. Edward Kenzikowski was 17 when he was arrested for a minor drug paraphernalia charge. With no prior criminal record, he was sentenced to months at the private lockups and a wilderness camp. He missed his senior year and a chance at a wrestling scholarship. After years of suffering from depression, he committed suicide at age 23. Unfortunately, these are just a few of the thousands of stories out there, thousands of lives ruined. So what was going on in this tiny town of Pennsylvania where kids suddenly had their lives flipped upside down? Why the hell was this happening? The rapid spike in incarcerations within the tiny county in the state of Pennsylvania went on for years. And for a while, no one seemed to notice. One by one, thousands of kids' lives were changed forever. And it's all thanks to these four people, Mark Chivarella, Michael Conahan, Robert J. Powell, and Robert Miracle. Judge Chivarella gained power in Pennsylvania shortly after the horrifying shooting at Columbine. In a time when schools, towns, and parents were scared about the safety of their children, zero tolerance policies began to rapidly spread across the country. Now, simple infractions like pranks or fights were treated as criminal offenses rather than instances that could be handled in school. In Pennsylvania, Judge Chivarella was a perfect choice, they thought, for this newly developed approach to juvenile issues. He had proudly announced that he was zero tolerance, that he would allegedly do anything to keep kids safe. And at first, no one batted an eye at his high conviction rates, thinking that this was what was best for the community. He was often invited to speak to students within the schools in the county. There, he would warn the kids, if you come before me, I will send you away. Year after year, he gave the same speech. And when kids found themselves in his courtroom, he would again bring up the speeches, asking the children if they had been there and proudly announcing, I said I would send you away before pounding his little gavel and loudly exclaiming that the juveniles were guilty of even the most minor of crimes. And for a little bit, he was praised by the schools, the police, and even some parents, but no one knew what was actually happening in the background. Back in 2000, a plan between four high ranking people was hatched. Robert J. Powell was a high profile lawyer who had become interested in building a new improved private juvenile detention center in Luzerne County. According to Judge Chivarella, the current detention center was in horrid condition. So he thought this new center was a wonderful plan. It would be a place he would feel comfortable with his kids staying if they should ever have to go. At least that's what he claimed. Then there was Judge Conahan, a longtime friend of Robert J. Powell and an established businessman. He brought the whole plan together. 
The two judges introduced Powell to Robert K. Miracle, a real estate developer who could help bring their for-profit juvenile detention center dreams to fruition. Two years later, their plan hit full stride when Judge Conahan was given the distinguished title of president judge. Now, the four men who had been working out a plan for almost four years had an unprecedented amount of authority. They controlled the budget, at least Judge Conahan did, and it wouldn't take long for him to take advantage of his newfound power. And before long, he had secretly signed a deal with Robert Powell agreeing to utilize the court's budget to pay 1.3 million in annual rent for the new centers. Then he put the nail in the coffin for the detention center already available in the counting, cutting off its funding. And just like that, their plan worked. There was now a new private facility and the two judges that helped bring the new center to reality were awarded handsomely. According to Judge Chivarella, the $2.7 million the two judges received for their efforts to open the new private for-profit detention centers was merely a finder's fee. That's it. He said, look, this was a finder's fee. We needed this center built. I was always yelling at kids because that's what they needed because parents didn't know how to be parents and so forth. So what's the big deal now? However, the way they acted after the center opened didn't seem to be quite as innocent as the judges tried to make it seem, not even close. If the money they received was merely a finder's fee, that would have been perfectly fine. Of course, as long as they declared it, but they did no such thing. Instead, they decided to hide their newfound riches through a variety of purchases that they could funnel the money through. And I think there's a saying for what that is, isn't there? Hmm, oh yeah, that's right, money laundering. It was right there on the tip of my tongue. But wait, there's more because of course. Now we've talked about private prisons before in this channel, but does anyone remember what they need to do to make sure they're making money? Now don't scream it all at once. That's right, they need to fill the prison. That's right. In this case, it was to fill the juvenile detention center and Chivarella was the perfect man for the job. He was sentencing juveniles to detention centers at twice the state average. And to make that even worse is the fact that he seemed to be doing it indiscriminately. According to detention center workers, they were told before proceedings exactly how many juveniles to expect by the end of the day, before the hearings. I can't even put into words how fucked up that is. Of course, Judge Chivarella and Judge Conahan had a vested interest in the success of their new juvenile centers and even quote, kept track of the number of children sent to the facility and how PACC was doing financially. Chivarella continued to monitor the profitability of PACC until 2008. Between the years 2003 to 2006, this little scheme led to over 2000 kids receiving excessively harsh sentences and being sent away, all due to the greed of four men. But eventually, as everything does, it came crashing down. In 2007, after a frantic call from an alarmed parent, the juvenile law center stepped in. Soon, the whole world would know what they had done, but this wasn't the end of the story. The legal proceedings that came to follow would prove to be a wild ride, so buckle up. In 2007 and 2008, the Kids for Cash scandal began to come crashing down. As the Juvenile Law Center began its investigation, the FBI soon joined them. If I were one of the four men behind this scheme at the time, I would be thinking one thing, we're screwed. On the surface though, this didn't seem to be their reaction. They seemed cool, calm, and collected, which looking back was likely one of the reasons for their impending downfall. In 2009, Mark Chivarella and Michael Conahan would find out what it felt like to be on the other side of the bench when the two were finally charged with the most lenient of charges that they were ever going to get, wire fraud and tax evasion. Considering what they had done, the lengths that they had put people through and the impact they had on their entire community, this didn't feel like enough. Still, the two initially pleaded guilty and were sentenced to serve roughly seven years. There was one small problem though, Mark Chivarella seemed absolutely incapable of keeping his mouth shut. For weeks after signing the original plea agreement, the former judge seemed to hop around town, in the media, literally anywhere he could, telling people he wasn't guilty. The only thing he'd done was forgot to tell the government that he had received the finder's fee. He certainly wasn't sending kids to a juvenile detention center for money. At least this is what he was convinced he needed to tell the world. Conahan wasn't much better after filing his plea too. He refused to discuss his motivation in the crimes and allegedly did his best to avoid ever having to meet with probation employees trying to conduct their investigations. Now, here's the thing. When you plead guilty to a crime, you're usually advised to no longer talk to people about said crime. And there's a reason for that. Prosecutors and judges don't usually take too kindly to people bouncing around claiming they were innocent and seemingly acting like nothing was wrong. 
In the case of these two former judges, that was especially true. In July of that very same year, Judge Edwin M. Kosick decided to deny the two plea agreements from the former judges and claimed to make his decision after seeing the comments and conduct of the two men. So little whoopsie daisy there. Part of his decision read, Defendant Chivarella had resorted to public statements of remorse, more for his personal circumstances, yet he continues to deny that he terms quid pro quo, his receipt of money as a finder's fee, notwithstanding the government's abundance of evidence of his routine deprivation of children's constitutional rights. By commitments to private juvenile facilities, he helped to create in return for a finder's fee in direct conflict with his judicial roles. Chivarella and Conahan were about to discover the true meaning of fuck around and find out. Instead of their original sentence, the two former judges were soon hit with federal indictment charges that included racketeering, fraud, money laundering, extortion, bribery, and federal tax violations. Double whoops. So not shockingly, after new indictments came rolling down the hill and with the system rapidly turning against them, the two judges decided to withdraw their pleas. Conahan decided to take the easier route. Instead of going through a lengthy trial, he once again pled guilty. This time, it was for the far more severe charges of racketeering conspiracy. In 2011, he was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. However, just nine years later, he would walk out of the prison, but not as a free man. At 68 years old, Conahan was deemed to be a high-risk member of the prison population, and in 2020, coronavirus was sweeping the world. So he was granted compassionate release. For him, the Kids for Cash scandal ended swiftly and without a lengthy trial. For Chivarella though, it was a much different story. If one thing was for certain, it's that he wasn't going down without a fight. He decided to actually plead not guilty. So in 2011, almost a decade after the scam began, he finally faced a trial for his atrocious actions. It took 11 days of testimony and a tidal wave of evidence. And in the end, he was found guilty on 12 of the 39 charges, including racketeering, conspiracy, money laundering conspiracy, and conspiracy to defraud the United States he was ordered to forfeit over $900,000 and sentenced to 28 years in prison. Of course, this wouldn't be the last time we heard from him. He pled his innocence from the start and was going to do everything he could to try to make the world believe him. For years, he filed appeal after appeal, most of them failing. All it takes is one time though, and it seemed for just a second that he might have figured it out. After years, it seemed like he was finally catching a break when in 2018, a federal judge decided to overturn some of his convictions. Sadly for him, this didn't end the way I'm sure he was hoping it would. Instead of adjusting his sentencing based on the dropped convictions, the judge decided to do no such thing. Instead, he held up the original 28 year sentence saying that the time still fits both the crime and the criminal. It seemed like Chivarella's arrogance at his court proceedings and media appearances once again shot him in the foot. The federal judge claimed that his refusal to acknowledge the scope of his remaining crimes was a massive aspect of his decision. When COVID-19 came rolling around, it seemed like he might have one last chance to get out before his original release date. Like Conahan, Chivarella was getting older in prison and was also considered to be high risk if he were to catch the virus. He claimed that the staff and his case manager had both selected him to participate in the early releases scheduled during the pandemic, but the warden refused. So the former judge once again found himself at the federal courts. Again, he was denied. Why? Well, because he quote, continues to downplay the seriousness of his criminal scheme. And that was his last chance. And once again, it seems like his attitude could have blown it. It marked the end of the criminal proceedings. But while you would think this would be the last you heard of the Kids for Cash scandal, there was more. While putting people in prison for their actions may feel like justice has been reached for some, that's not the case for all. And the kids and the parents who had been undoubtedly impacted by the greed of these four men, it just wasn't enough. So a slew of civil suits came streaming down. And this time, the men behind the scheme would have to pay and not just with their freedom, but with some cold, hard cash. And before we go to take a look at those civil suits, I'm just going to take a moment to thank today's sponsors. Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. Now that the holidays are starting to wind down, you may have gotten some great deals, but do you feel like maybe you could have saved just a little bit more? Well, maybe you should have been using Honey. And that's because thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. 
All you do is shop on your favorite sites and at checkout, the Honey button appears and all you have to do is click apply coupons, wait a couple seconds, and if it finds a working coupon, you'll watch prices drop. You guys know one of my favorite ways to use Honey is for getting coupons on pizza, which by the way, many coupons on pizza. Almost every time I play a D&D session with friends and I get to order pizza, I'll always get like a 15%, 20%. I even got a 30% coupon like a couple weeks ago. That was very nice. And Honey doesn't just work on desktops, but it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. So if you don't already have Honey, you could just be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. So get PayPal for free at joinhoney.com slash MLM. It's joinhoney.com slash MLM. Now, self-care is always pretty much top of mind for me, but in between meditation sessions and trips to the yoga studio or nail salon, how often are you taking care of all your needs? Well, if you're even wondering about that for even a split second, maybe you should take a look at today's sponsor, Dipsy. Now, Dipsy's been sponsoring the channel for some time now, and many of you know that Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories that are designed by women for women. But did you know that Dipsy does a little more than that? In addition to new content that's released every single week, they also have sleep stories, wellness sessions, and even stories that you can read. So even if you're not in the mood to get a little bit spicy, you can listen to something while you go to sleep, which by the way, very relaxing. I don't know if any of you all are into that, like just kind of listening to someone softly talk about something while you go to sleep, but Dipsy has got you covered if you are. And for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash MLM. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash MLM, dipsystories.com slash MLM. Finally, after almost two decades of what some call the biggest scandal to ever hit the juvenile justice system, it seems like it's coming to an end. Well, at least legally it's over. For the kids who are now adults, this will likely continue to be a painful memory for the rest of their lives, despite 2000 of their juvenile records being officially expunged by Pennsylvania in 2012. For the four men involved in creating the scandal and ruining thousands of kids' lives though, their cases are over. In 2011, the builder, Robert K. Miracle, settled his civil lawsuit with the juveniles who had been impacted by the scheme. He agreed to pay $17 million to those impacted. Then four years later in 2015, Robert Powell, the man who some argue started it all, reached an end to his civil lawsuit. In the end, he was ordered to pay $4.5 million to the 2,400 juveniles who had appeared in front of Chivarella between 2003 and 2008. In his trial, he testified that he had been forced to pay thousands of dollars to the two judges in exchange for their support of the two juvenile facilities. I don't know, like honestly, how much of that had been like, you know, forced, but I digress, it doesn't ultimately matter, I guess. So that leaves us with our final two monsters. After an insane array of legal proceedings and a seemingly endless amount of litigation, the tale of the two judges that started this all is finally over as of August of this year. As with the other two members of the infamous Kids for Cash scandal, both of the former judges found themselves facing civil lawsuits from the children involved. For them, the civil suit started in 2009, right as their federal indictments came crashing down. The fight for some sort of justice or reparations for the pain they caused thousands of families was long. Over time, the judge proceeding over the civil case heard over 300 different survivors, each more heartbreaking than the last. For the kids, the pain still seemed fresh as many had attempted to bury their past in their minds and now they had to bring it back up. One kid who testified told the morning call, I kind of buried my emotional trauma and I tried putting everything behind me. You can't really move past something unless you either fix the problem or you bury it deep inside. So I just kind of buried my problems. So this kind of brought that back to light a little bit. The civil proceedings also brought to light the horrifying truth about what happened to the children after the scheme was over. 65 of them had dropped out of school, others suffered from depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder, and many are now struggling with addiction. All of this because some people just wanted to make money. After years of reliving the trauma, court proceedings, and an onslaught of constant media coverage, the case finally came to an end with closing statements in October, 2021. Finally, it was over and all that was left was to wait. At long last, a decision was announced in August, 2022, ordering the two former judges to pay over $200 million. And that seems like a victory, right? Well, kind of. 
according to NPR, it's unlikely that the victims will see anything from that decision. Of course, the former judge's assets are going to be probed, but with a price tag of almost $1,000 for each person, it seems almost impossible that they'll receive any of it. Still, the decision has been met with a sense of victory for the survivors and the Juvenile Law Center, which helped bring the scandal to light so many years ago. Levitt, co-founder and chief counsel of the center told NPR, it's a huge victory. To have an order from federal court that recognizes the gravity of what the judges did to these children in the midst of some of the most critical years of their childhood and development matters enormously, whether or not money gets paid. With all of this coming to an end, it's easy to feel a sense of vindication, but the Kids for Cash scandal didn't only bring to light the corruption and dishonesty of four men, it brought to light the atrocities of the juvenile criminal justice system in the United States as a whole. None of this would have been possible without the sudden uprising of zero tolerance policies that the four men used to explain away their corruption. What was championed as a way to keep things safe seems to have done the opposite. It developed what people now call the school to prison pipeline. Now, when kids get in trouble at school, it becomes a legal matter rather than school discipline. For kids of color, this new manner of discipline impacts them at an outrageously disproportionate rate. Today, the United States puts more kids behind bars than almost every other country combined. The Kids for Cash scandal was a symptom of a much bigger problem, one that persists and continues to grow to this day. While this scam story has come to an end, there are others that are still looming in the distance. But with all of that being said, that is where we're going to end today's episode of Multi-Level Mondays. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. Thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. I really do appreciate it. And if you'd like to connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you click my link tree link in the description box. It's going to get you to all of my social media and current projects that I'm involved in, including the Leftist Mafia, a fun podcast panel that I'm doing every Thursday evening. So thank you so much for joining me for today's episode. I do really appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye. 